Hello, I'm Mr Vossa and I'm a computing science teacher. In this pre-recorded video, I'm going to take you through how you work through exam style questions in the Web Design Development Unit for National 5 Computing Science. Web Design Development is one of four units, the other three units being Computer Systems, Database Design and Development and Software Design and Development. Within the Web Design Development Unit, we're going to go through each of the stages that you would expect us to go through when solving any computing type problem. We start off with the analysis and design. We'll then look at some implementation where we'll be focused on CSS, HTML and some JavaScript, which are the three main areas that we're going to be examined on within this unit. And then we'll also look at, of course, testing as well as evaluation. We're going to look at all of those bits in the context of the exam style questions that we might see in an assessment. We'll look carefully and closely at how we get marks and also talk about some of the information that will be presented to us in the question to make sure we're making as much use as the information that is provided to us as possible to be able to link that with our prior knowledge to be able to give answers that are going to maximise the number of marks that we can get. Of course, if there's anything that we look at and you're not too sure of it, then make sure you look at other online resources or you speak to your teacher to look at the materials that you've used in class and to help go through those activities again. I wish you well with your revision and preparation for your examinations and your assessments and hopefully this video will be useful. Let's get started. So our learning intentions. We're learning to apply our knowledge and computational thinking skills to the analysis, design, implementation, testing and evaluation of practical solutions to solve web-based problems. So to do this, we're going to need to be able to recognize HTML, CSS, JavaScript and those development tools and how they work to solve coding problems. Being able to recognize the question is essential part of our success criteria and being able to understand the style of response that we're going to need to include to be able to get all the marks that are available. So it's a case of recognizing the question, taking our prior knowledge, using our problem solving skills to be able to apply our knowledge to the question that has been set to be able to ensure we can achieve the maximum amount of marks available. Here are some generic tips that you could apply to any examination, but I think it's really important to think about them in terms of a computing science context as well. So make sure you take the time to read the question and understand what you're being asked to do. So quite often there is information within the question which will help you problem solve the answer. So taking the time to understand any key words, taking the time to understand all the information that's being presented to you is absolutely essential. Make sure as you're working through these questions, you're managing your mindset. It's going to be absolutely possible that sometimes there's questions that you don't really understand or you're not completely sure what the answer is. Well, taking that time to go through that question and understand what is being asked you will hopefully mean you can use your problem solving skills to be able to work out the answer or something pretty close to the answer where you might pick up some marks. So keeping positive and continuing to have a go is really important. Of course, you've only got a limited amount of time in your assessment or your examination time and making all of that time count is really important. Either spending the time methodically going through the paper and keeping to a time outline that you've set yourself or using any spare time at the end to go back through your questions is absolutely critical. And finally, make sure you're keeping your answers really clear. Your teacher or the examiner will be marking your paper and they want to be able to easily identify what is your answer and potentially how you arrived at that answer. So making sure you've used a clear structure or you've clearly identified where you've answered a question if, for instance, you've had a go and then you've decided to have another go and make some changes and, and you've arrived to a different answer. You can just cross things out by putting a single line through them. The examiner will look for the answer and identify it, but just try and keep everything neat and tidy. Avoid scribbling or anything like that in the exam. 
OK, let's have a little talk about what's going to happen in this video. So I'm going to present questions to you on the screen. I'll read through the question and I'll just make sure it's fully explained before I pause the video. When the video is paused, use the time to work through your answers. Once you've worked through the answer, unpause your video and then come back and see whether we've got the same answer. And I will talk you through how I worked through to get to that answer. Where there's the pause icon, there's also a suggested time about how long you should take on the question. This is a notional amount of time just to give you a bit of a guide, but I would certainly try to stick to that time as closely as possible to ensure that you're having the right pace for when you are in your assessment or examination. Let's start by looking at this first question. So the question says, add HTML body, H1, and title, opening and closing elements to complete the code below. And we can see it's worth three marks. So we know we're going to need to add some HTML. And we've been given the three tags that we're going to need. Body, H1, and title. And we need to identify both the opening and closing elements to complete the code. So looking at the code, we can see we have an HTML tag opening. We then have ourselves a head tag. We then have my first web page between two blanks and a closing head tag. We have a blank. We have another blank. Welcome to my site. We have a blank. Then we have a P tag. Here is a web page that I have created, a closing P tag, a blank, and an closing HTML tag. So this is worth three marks. So we should allow ourselves about three marks, three minutes to get this completed. Pause the video now and give it a go. So we're looking at how we add HTML body, H1 and title, opening and closing tags. We can see in the first two blanks, we have a title opening tag and we have a closing title tag. Each HTML tag has an opening tag and a corresponding closing tag. You'll see the tags nest within each other. So for example, HTML is opened at the top and then HTML is closed at the bottom. And within that, we've got head and body nested. Talking of body, we can see that the blank underneath head, that should be body and therefore the closing tag, which is our slash and then body, is just above the HTML closing tag, which leaves us with two remaining tags, which is the H1 tag and then a closing H1 tag. So we need to put each of those in to get the marks. You get the marks for having both the opening and closing tag. You need both in the right place to get the mark. Hopefully, this should be a relatively easy question, which falls within the first section of an exam or written assessment. That's where the questions are slightly shorter answer based questions as opposed to longer problem solving style questions. OK, let's move on and have a look at question number two. Question two, an archaeology club wants a website to provide information about the club and how to join. A screenshot of the completed homepage is shown below. Evaluate the website in terms of its fitness for purpose and it's worth one mark. We can then also see the screenshot of the web page which says Archaeology Club. Welcome to the website for the Archaeology Club. Here you will find links to the different pages on the site as well as lots of information about different aspects of archaeology. Then there's a photograph. Areas of the site, fossils, dino facts. This club is part of the British Archaeological Society. So we're looking at this website and we're trying to evaluate the website in terms of its fitness for purpose. Because we need to do a little bit of evaluation and there's a little bit to look at with this question, I would suggest you take about two minutes to be able to get your answer down. Pause the video now and do that now. 
So the website in this case is not fit for purpose because there's no information about how to join the club. So if you remember, when we're evaluating websites and we're talking about fitness for purpose, a website is deemed to be fit for purpose if it meets the end user requirements, which were determined in the analysis phase. Now, if it meets the functional requirements, that's another reason for it to be fit for purpose. And they're also identified in the analysis phase. So we either need to be achieving items that are from the end user requirements or meeting items that have been set in the functional requirements to be deemed as fit for purpose. So if the website is not fit for purpose, it's not going to meet either our end user requirements or our functional requirements. And therefore, it would be ne necessary for the developer to revisit the previous phases of the development process to either re-undertake the analysis to make sure the problem was fully understood and correctly understood, or revisit the design to be able to recreate a new implementation which does meet either the end user requirements and all the functional requirements, depending on what didn't quite marry up. So very clearly in this case study here, it says an archaeology club wants a website to provide information about the club and how to join. So there's certainly a little bit of information about the club and the different aspects of tech archaeology that they're interested in. But there is no information and no links to any information about how to join the club. So the website is not fit for purpose for that reason. Let's look at our third question here. The HTML code below is used to create a web page. We've got our opening HTML and head tags. We've got a title tag, which has got French facts in between it. And then we're opening a style tag, which has H1 text align right. The style tag is then closing. We've then got a head tag, which should be a closing head tag. So there's actually a little error there in that uh, code. And then we've got an opening body tag. Below the body tag, we have heading one, an H1 tag for France. We have a paragraph tag, so the P tag, facts about France. And then we have a UL tag. UL stands for unordered list. We then have three LI tags with their associated closing tags after some text. And those LI tags stand for list items. The unordered list tag is then closed. The body tag is then closed and the HTML tag is closed. We can see on the right hand side, we've got ourselves a space that looks like a, a browser window where we're going to be able to draw how this web page will look when viewed in a browser. Some of the content has already been added. So this is about us being able to understand where the other content goes in relation to the content that we've already been given. There's obviously a bit of code to read through and we're gonna need a little bit of drawing. It's worth two marks, the question, so we're not gonna to have to put too much information in, but I would give yourself up to three minutes to get this done. Pause the video now and have a go at that. Okay, let's have a little look then at what it looks like. So, we can see here we've got a heading one tag that needs to go in because if we look up to the top, we can see the title tag is already in and then H1 is the next uh, piece of information that's going on the tag. And that says France. Now, if we read up a little bit, we can see in the style section, it says H1 should be text aligned right. So we've right aligned that text. The facts about France paragraph information uh, is just the default font, default size, and by default, things are left aligned. So we can see that's on the left and that paragraph information has been put in for us. We've then got the three list items in the unordered list. So an unordered list has uh, bullet points. Um, if it was an OL, that would be an ordered list and therefore it would give us numbers as opposed to bullet points. And I've got the three bullet points in there with the information just as it's been written there, capital, Paris, population 67M, and then the flag, the tricolor. So that information has been written in. Now you get one mark for right aligning uh, France, and you get the second mark for getting the three bullet points 
accurately put in on the left hand side. So there's a few things you have to do to achieve the mark for each of the two marks that's available. So making sure you follow the code carefully is really important. Hence why I'm saying give yourself a few moments to get that done. OK, that's uh, reading and understanding some HTML code. Let's look at question number four. The fourth question, Chill Zone is an online electrical retailer. Fridge freezers need to be added to its current website. Analysis was carried out to identify the requirements for the fridge freezer pages. Part of the analysis report is shown below. Each new page of the site should focus on a specific fridge freezer. Each page should also allow a user to view pictures, read reviews, and view the technical specifications of each fridge freezer. The page should also include a video showing the item in use. Using the information from the analysis report above, identify two end user requirements of the fridge freezer pages. Now this is worth a couple of marks. So we're going to need to make sure that we've identified two end user requirements really clearly. And I would allow ourselves a couple of minutes to get this done. So pause the video now and give yourself a couple of minutes to get question four done. OK, so here's the question information again. Effectively, we're looking for two end user requirements. So during the analysis phase, web developers consider these end user requirements. And the term end user describes the group of people who are most likely to use a website. So if a web development company has a clear idea of the target audience, then they will take that into account for what works best for that group of users when creating a website. So, you know, that might be looking to design things for very young children, uh, older people, maybe inexperienced users, particular type of client base or a particular type of customer, an employee who's undergone particular training, for example, as well as uh, those who may be skilled or expert users. So in this case, we're obviously looking at customers um, who are going to be using the uh, fridge freezer pages. And so a customer will want to view the picture on the web page, just as it was identified in the analysis. They want to be able to read the reviews, likely to be reviews written by other customers, but potentially uh, reviews that have been written by magazines or um, other testers. They'll also want to provide, um, be able to read the technical specification that will have been provided by the uh, manufacturer. And they'll also have wanted to be able to uh, watch the video. So we just need to state two of these and just put a little bit of an explanation around them to get ourselves the two marks that are available for this question. Question number five, then. All the images that Chill Zone want to use are on the fridge freezer manufacturer's websites. Describe what Chill Zone, Chill Zone must do to avoid prosecution under the Copyright Designs and Patents Act when using these images. So it's a one mark question. So we should take about a minute to answer this question. And it's just drawing on our knowledge of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act and applying it to what Chill Zone must do in the situation where they want to avoid prosecution, but they want to use images of the fridge freezers from the manufacturer's website. Pause the video now, give yourself about a minute to get the answer down on paper. So to avoid prosecution, there's a couple of things that Chill Zone can do. The first thing they can do is ask for permission and get the permission from the manufacturers to be able to use the pictures. If that's successful, then that's great. Otherwise, what they might need to do is they might need to pay for or buy a license to be able to use the manufacturer's pictures on the website. It's likely that as Chill Zone is a retailer of a uh, fridge freezer, um, the manufacturers would let them use the uh, pictures without needing a license, but that would be an acceptable answer. Looking at question number six, we can see here that Chill Zone must select one of the fridge freezer images below. Each image has the same resolution. 
Let's look at the image information. So we've got image A, starfrostfree.jpg, 800 by 400. And then we've got image B, starfrostfree.gif, 800 by 400. So the images look very similar, if not identical. And we can see here they've got the same name and the same resolution, but they have different file name endings. State one advantage of each image compared to the other. So this is a two mark question drawing on our knowledge about different image formats. So I would give yourself about two minutes just to be able to answer this question. So pause the video now and give that a go. OK, so here's a reminder then of the question. Chill zone, got some images and some fridge freezers. They're the same resolution, but they're different file formats. We're looking some advantages for the JPEG and some advantages for the GIF file. So if we start off by looking at image A, which is the JPEG, with JPEG, there is a greater color depth. So if the image was full of lots of different vivid colors, then the uh, JPEG would certainly be more suitable than the GIF. The compression rate of a JPEG can also be changed. So compression is obviously a good thing for when we're making use of internet files that we want to keep as small as possible. That ensures that they don't take up lots of bandwidth when they're being transferred across the network. So they should be able to get across quickly if we've compressed them down. And talking about compression, JPEGs use lossy compression, which does mean that some information will be lost when compression occurs, but we can get a really high level of compression so we can get that file size nice and small. So there's some advantages there of a JPEG, and it's just about stating which advantage is most suitable uh, to the image that, that you think. In terms of image B, that's the GIF. I think the biggest advantage that comes with the uh, GIF selection is being able to make use of transparency. So that's where the background effectively becomes see-through. That may be suitable if they want to layer a number of images together. It could be that they want to include the image within an animation. So GIFs loan themselves to being animated, maybe for marketing purposes. GIFs, uh, when they're compressed, use lossless compression. So there's no quality loss when the uh, compression occurs. And there's also control over the color depth, which will impact the file size. So being able to um, take one of these points and make it into the uh, advantage for that image type. So there's good things about both. And then that would allow the developers to choose which image type they think would be most suitable for their needs. And that very much depends on what they're trying to achieve. But this question here is just asking us to give some advantages so we can do that for each of the two images and their file types. OK, we've got some code here. So let's take a look at this code. Some of the HTML code used to create one of the pages on the Chill Zones website is shown below. Got the HTML and head opening tags. We've got a title of Star Frost Free. We've got a link to a style sheet, and the style sheet's called chillstyle.css, and that information is all in the head section. Looking now at our body section, we've got a heading one followed by a heading two. We've then got some paragraph, we've got some image, and with that image, we can see an on mouse over event and then we've got an h2 heading and then we've got ourselves a couple of paragraph tags that are given the class review and then just to finish off near the bottom there we've got a paragraph paragraph tag which says go to and then we've got an a href tag opening up there with home page on it so let's step through then and look at the question when viewed in a browser the fridge freezer can be displayed as either an image showing the door open or an image showing the door closed. Identify the JavaScript event used to implement this feature. So this is a one mark question. Obviously, we've spent some time looking through the code already. Uh, so pause, have a little think about the code that we've seen and identify 
the JavaScript event that we use to implement the feature. So looking at the answer then here, I've just extracted a little bit of the uh, HTML code for us. And we can see here we've got the image, src equals, and then it gives us the file name of the image. And then we've got the on mouse over. So that event is the JavaScript event. So it detects when the mouse is over the image. And then when the mouse is over the image, then it's changing the images file to starfrostfreeclosed.jpg. Looking at the uh, code then as a whole, just to highlight where it is, it was about halfway down. And it is talking about this on mouse over rent is the bit that we want to focus in on. That is where we see the JavaScript in action. OK, let's have a look then at question number eight. The code below is added. Describe two purposes of this code. So we'll look at the code that we have here. So we've got video width equals 500, height equals 250, controls. Source src equals starfrostfree.mp4, type equals video mp4, and then the video tag is closed. So we need to look closely at the code and pick out two aspects of this code to describe what the purpose of the code is is. It's a two mark question. So pause the video now, giving yourself about two minutes to get down two purposes. OK, hopefully you've got a couple of purposes uh, down now. So I'm just going to talk through a few of the acceptable answers. So the width equals 500 is providing the width dimensions for the video in terms of how big it will display on the screen. The height 250 is providing the height dimension of how high the video will appear on the screen. The controls bit is identifying that the video will have controls available for the user to be able to play and pause the video. The source src starfrostfree.mp4 is identifying the file name of the video so that it can be embedded into the web page. And the purpose of type equals video MP4 is to tell the browser it's a video of the MP4 video type that's going to need to be played. This is a two mark question. So any two clearly defined purposes will get you those marks. Question number nine asks, explain why the line of code below is included in every page of the website. And then we've got link rel equals style sheet, type equals text, CSS, href equals chill style dot CSS. So we just have to explain why the line of code has been included in every page of a website. It's a one mark question. You should just be able to draw upon your knowledge of style sheets to be able to answer it. So give yourself a minute. Pause and give that a go now. OK, so the reason we use this in every website is to be able to apply the style sheet. So particular styling to every web page on the website, because that gives consistency for the user experience across all the web pages. Question number 10 asks state one security precaution that Chillzone should take to protect its customers payment details when buying online. This is another one mark question. Should be able to get this just um, through your knowledge of security precautions. It should only give yourself a minute to get this done. Pause the video and give that a go now. OK, so there's a couple of security precautions that Chillzone could use. One of them is, of course, to encrypt their data at National 5, just saying that encrypting data to keep it secure is sufficient enough to get the mark in this case, because it's just asking for a generic security precaution. Another security precaution is, of course, Chillzone could use a firewall to protect unauthorized access to their computer network where they process customer payment details. Let's have a look at question number 11. 
The Giants basketball team has a website. The website contains the following four pages. Homepage, information about the club, upcoming fixtures, how to contact the club. All the pages on the site include a link back to the homepage. The page with fixture information also contains an external hyperlink to the Scottish Basketball League. Draw the navigational structure for this website. So we've been given some information about a website and we're going to draw the navigational structure. So that's how all the pages are linked together. It's a four mark question. I would suggest you give yourself four to five minutes to be able to process that information and get your navigational structure drawn. Pause the video now and give that a go. OK, so as a reminder, we've been given four pages, the home page, information about the club, the upcoming fixtures, how to contact the club, and also some information about how those pages link back to the home page. The page with fixture information also contains an external hyperlink to the Scottish Basketball League. So we need to be able to represent that to show how all those pages are linked together. Let's have a look at the navigational structure. So we can see here this is a hierarchical design. We've got the home page at the top and we've got coming off of that three pages, information about the club, upcoming fixtures and how to contact the club. We can also see coming off the fixture page is the link to the Scottish Basketball League. So in terms of where the four marks come from, the first mark comes from identifying the home page. Your second mark comes for identifying that you've got three pages connected to the home page. And you can see for the third mark, the three arrows there show the direction of travel for the user is from the home page to the sub pages and then back to the home page. So the arrows go both ways. For the fourth mark, you've got your external link to the Scottish Basketball League, and that's an arrow going out of the website. So there's not necessarily a link back to the website. So it's just an outwards arrow for people to navigate away from the website. So that's how the four marks come together. So all that information is there in the question. It's just a case of drawing out that information and being able to put that into the hierarchical design that we see here. The other type of uh, layout or navigational structure design that we see for websites at National 5 is linear linkage. And this is where pages are linked together in an order. And you visit one page, then the next page, and then the next page. Of course, it's just a case of taking time to read through the information that's been given, process it, and then create a design that's appropriate and follows the specification. Before the next question, let's look at this website. The upcoming fixtures for July are shown on the web page below. We can see it's the Giants fixtures web page. That's in the title, upcoming fixtures in July, little giants with a logo, opponent date, venue, styled slightly differently, the information, and then we've got a link to the homepage and also that link to the Scottish Basketball League. So the question that goes along with this is the text opponent date venue is styled using the following rule, hashtag fixtures, open ourselves the curly brackets, font size 14 pixels, background color white, text align left, color navy. State the type of selector used in the above style. It's a one mark question, so give yourself about a minute. Do that now. Cascading style sheets can be used to style web pages. So HTML tells the browser what to display on a web page. The CSS is telling the browser how to display it, how it will look. So the CSS files consist of a set of CSS rules. And the CSS rule is made up of the selector and then the declaration. And then the declaration's got both the property and the value. So in this case here, our selector is hashtag fixtures. And then within the declaration, an example would be a property of font size and a value of 14 points. However, this is where it's important we read the question really carefully. So it's not asking us to state the selector, it's asking us to state the type of selector used in the above style. And we can see here that the selector is, is quite clearly 
referring to a unique ID. So in the HTML, we, for example, might have a P paragraph tag, and that paragraph tag may have been given an ID of fixtures. Now, when we get to CSS, the CSS rule will only apply to the elements that are called fixtures, and the hashtag symbol is used in the CSS to let the browser know that the selector will apply a style to any element with the ID fixtures. So while the selector is fixtures, it's a ID or a unique ID selector that's been used in the above style. So that's why just double checking that we've definitely understood what's being asked. So here we're being asked for the type of selector. It's an element ID, a unique ID, which is identifying to the browser which bits of HTML this applies to. So that's a tricky one mark question. Just got to make sure you're really clear with the different types of CSS rules and how they are made up to be really on top of these types of questions. Question 13 asks, each away game should have a red background with yellow text. Write a single style rule that could be used to style all of the away games. So we're being asked to write some CSS, and that CSS is having to, to be a single style rule that can be used to style all of the away games. So we're going to need to make sure that we are accurate with the CSS code that we use and how the CSS rule is written out. Obviously, the last question, we had an example of what that CSS looked like. So you can certainly use that as a template to be able to build the rule to answer this question. So if you want to rewind a little bit and look at that, that's no problem at all. It's a three mark question. So you should allow yourself about three minutes and really focus on the accuracy of your CSS rule. So the CSS has been written here. Now you can see I've used a full stop instead of a hashtag. So the hashtag is when we're referring to ID selectors, but we can also use classes. And classes operate in a similar way to the element IDs, but rather than relating to the ID of an individual element, styles for a class can be applied across a range of elements. So we're trying to apply it to a range of away games. We've then been asked to style it with a background color red and the text color is yellow. So we've gone color yellow. For the three marks there, we want to make sure that we're accurately identifying that we're using classes with the CSS here. And then we've got the right information in our declaration in terms of the properties are correct as well as the values of those properties as well. Question 14. During testing, it was found that the external hyperlink shown below did not navigate to the Scottish Basketball League website. Then we've got ahref equals Scottish Basketball League dot HTML. The text Scottish Basketball League and then the A tag being closed. Describe the problem with the addressing that has been highlighted by this testing. So this is a one mark question. It's just a case of looking at the link and identifying what the issue is. This should take you less than a minute to do. Pause, give it a go now. Okay, so we know that this is linking to an external web page. So an external web page is likely to be www.scottishbasketballleague.com or something similar. Um, so that's an external absolute reference link that we should be using. What we've got here is a relative referencing to a web page that would sit as an internal hyperlink on the same web page. So just identifying that we should be linking to an external site will be enough to get us the one mark. Question 15 is saying all the video, audio and images used on the Giants website are stored in a folder called media in the following location. And then we've got a little image there that's got a folder that says site, giants, and then media. 
And then we've got three files there, logo.png, crowdsharing.mp3, warmup.mp4. Identify the graphic file format used to store the image. So this is a case of just looking at the information that's been presented and identifying the file format used. You should allow yourself about one minute to undertake this one mark question. Pause now. So the file type is PNG. That's a portable network graphic often used on web pages. So it's just a case of recalling that file format information and getting that down on paper. OK, let's have a look at question number 16. Each page on the site displays an image of the giant's logo in the same position. Write the code that would be needed to display this image on the club information website. In the image there, we can see that there is a site and then there is a giant's folder. And in there, you then got the different pages of information. Media as a folder, club info as a page, contact as a page, fixtures as a page, and home as a page. This is a two mark question. So give yourself about two minutes to answer the question. Pause the video now. So the reason we want to spend a couple of minutes on this question is because it involves a little bit of problem solving. So from the first part of the question, we'd seen that we'd identified the image file as a PNG file called logo.png. But we now need to identify the relative reference to where that file is stored to the club information page. So we can see the club information page, club info, is stored in the folders site and then giants. And then for the logo that's going to be displayed on that club information page, that's stored inside the media folder and it's called logo.png. So in the answer to the question, we have to make sure we include that full file path information to demonstrate that we understand which file is being used to display the image, as well as the relative reference to the club info page. So that's in the media folder. So image SRC equals media, and then we put logo.png. So that's one mark for the correct relative location with no other folders before it. So you can't put site, giants, and then media because that would be the wrong relative address. It has to be just media. And then we need to have the graphic file name logo.png for the second mark. So the second mark there, logo.png, is certainly easier to pick up than the first mark, which is just identifying the folder which is stored in, but it does require that little bit of problem solving. So you've got to be really careful to read the question and have that focus on the detail to be able to achieve all the marks that are available. Thank you for joining me in the last 40 to 45 minutes. I really hope going through each of those questions has helped you look more closely at different parts of the web design development unit and has got you thinking about the best way to get the marks, whether that's to do with CSS, HTML or JavaScript. I guess my tip always is when you're coding is to make the best attempt you can and try and really focus on your accuracy of syntax to make sure your code is going to gain as many marks as possible. If there was anything that you studied and you're not sure of that still, please go and find other online resources, revisit your class materials or go and speak to your class teacher to get some more help. It's about you preparing the best you can for the assessments that you have ahead. I wish you the best of luck with those assessments and those examinations and thank you very much for watching. The questions in this presentation were taken from the 2019 SQA National 5 Computing Science Pass Paper. You can find the full copy of the questions as well as the marking instructions on the SQA website.